We'll see. Oh, perfect. I was just going to say we were going to start in a few minutes, but here we go. Back in the garage. <laughs> ah. Are they still in it? What are they doing? Oh. <laughs> That's funny. Good morning. Courtney? <laughs> Are you whenever you're done? Good morning. Today is Tuesday, September 24th, 2013 at 9.04 uh, in the morning and I would like to call this meeting to order. In fact, I will call this meeting to order. Um, first, I'd like to introduce board members and staff. To my far left, we have board member Didi Diadamo. To my immediate left, Vice Chair Fine Spivey Weber. To my immediate right, board member Tam Doduck. And to the far right, but not really the far right, we have board member Stephen Moore. <laughs> Mr. Howard, will you please introduce the staff? Yes, thank you. Uh, assisting the board today, Courtney Davis and Janine Townsend. To my left, Michael Lawfer, Chief Counsel. To my right, John Bishop and Karen Turgovich, Chief Deputies. Thank you. Um, many of you know, but not everyone knows, the emergency evacuation procedure. Just look and find one of the exit signs, uh, either a lit one or a text one that's flat. Why we have both, I'm not entirely sure. But um, f look and see the one nearest to you, and if you hear a sound that sounds like an emergency alarm, Please proceed carefully with all your belongings and your friends. Uh, our emergency assembly place is in Cesar Chavez Park, which is uh, just across the street, um, and that's where you'll find out when the all clear to come back uh, happens. 
Um, also, this meeting is being webcast and recorded, so please speak into the microphone when you come up to it. It's a little sensitive, so you have to stay closer to it than you might think. Um, and then lastly, please take your electronic devices and turn the sound off or turn them off uh, for the duration of the meeting out of courtesy to your colleagues. Next, we get to go to a Sustain Superior Accomplishment Awards, and I'm happy to see such a big crew here for it, so I can't wait. We have three of them. Right. I guess I get to go first. Oh, thank you. Is it on? Hello? All right. Good morning, Chair Marcus and members of the board. My name is Karen Larson. I am the Deputy Director of the Office of Information Management and Analysis here at the State Board, and I'm here to present to John Marshak a Sustained Superior Aco Accomplishments Award for all of his work, his tireless efforts in working with the California Water Quality Monitoring Council on their efforts to coordinate all water quality monitoring among agencies throughout the state. For those of you who do not know about the council, they were formed by the legislature back in 2006, and again, they were charged with coordinating all monitoring and making the water quality monitoring more efficient among state agencies. And the resources that they got to do that was one position, and John is in that position and has fulfilled um, that mission very well with his passion and drive and pressure to um, meet the mission of the council. The way that the council actually um, coordinates monitoring is rather than putting an edict out saying thou shalt do monitoring this way they've decided to collect monitoring information on specific question specific themes like is it safe to swim in our waters is is it safe to eat fish and shellfish and they've formed working groups to pull together that monitoring information and assess it and then make it available to the public through web portals. There are nine working groups that are working on either the four portals that have already been released or the additional portals that, portals that are under development, two of which are slated to be released this fall. And uh, John both works with the council and the care and keeping of a council. Those of you who have worked with a board know what that's like. Um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> as well as the nine working groups, all of uh, whom have multiple stakeholder interests involved. And uh, John is just very passionate, uh, provides good direction, and uh, keeps the tasks moving along and the momentum going with the very meager resources that we have to meet the council's mission. So with that, I want to congratulate John Marshak on his sustained superior accomplishment. Thank you very much. I'd first like to thank Karen Larson and Rich Brewer, my supervisors, for nominating me for this award and for providing support, both moral and, and PY, <laughs> to keep me going in this endeavor. Um, I also want to thank all of the collaborators in this project in many organizations throughout state government, local government, federal agencies, as well as non-governmental organizations. They really have put in countless hours of work to get these portals up and running to help the council in its work and to improve water quality and aquatic ecosystem monitoring assessment and reporting. Um, further, I'd like to thank Val Connor for convincing me to take this job five years ago and come over from the Central Valley region and to teach me to run with scissors, which I do on a regular basis. Uh, my mother would be upset, but she's not with us anymore. <laughs> um, and finally, I'd like to thank former executive officer of the Central Valley Region, Tom Pinkos, who hired me 32 years ago and was my mentor for over 20 years. Thanks all. Good morning. So I'm Darren Paul Hemus, Deputy Director of the Division of Administrative Services. We're the division that uh, you guys don't get to see very much. Uh, so it's uh, with great pleasure that I get to uh, highlight one of my excellent staff today. Uh, let me tell a little story first. So um, the Water Board is made up of 
uh, scientists like uh, John Marshak of High Caliber, engineers and geologists, and uh, we're one of the few state agencies that have this diverse uh, small cadre of state workers. We're not the typical bureaucracy uh, of state agencies. And so uh, we administer our own HR tests. We have to recruit our own people. We're kind of out on our own in a way to make sure that we get good people. Uh, and um, along with that comes a story of that uh, we're regulated too. There are state control agencies that uh, are the bane of my existence at times, or so it seems. I guess a little dose of our own medicine in a way. Uh, and at one point they said, uh, gee, guess what, uh, that exam you're doing is all canceled and we have to cancel the list and you need to do a full job analysis to support it. So uh, you can imagine the panic that sets in at that moment realizing that, uh, gee, what, what's going to happen if we can't actually continue to keep staffing and what are we going to do associated with that? So uh, in that moment of panic, uh, we had someone that stepped up and uh, basically said, uh, I'll do it. And with that, I'd like to introduce Denise Perry and make her come up here and be embarrassed. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So Denise was the one that said, uh, sure, I'll go take training on that. I've never done this before, but hey, let's, let's do this. Let's do it right. Let's do it fast. And uh, basically set some land speed records on, making sure that we saw very little interruption uh, in the type of personnel tests that we could keep going. Uh, so she did such a good job, we just kept her at it. So now we've made her do a couple more. Um, she, even, she even humors me and takes my uh, suggestions when I uh, try to make the test harder and stuff like that. So uh, with that, I really appreciate Denise's uh, service and it's uh, a pleasure to have you. So thank you very much. So uh, I always hate to say this, especially because I have tremendous respect for John and Denise, but I think we saved the best for last today. Today, I want to honor Imel Wadwani. Imel, why don't you come on up? Uh, you've seen a lot of Imel lately, board members, and uh, there's good reason for that. She's one of our best. Um, I'm very fortunate that I inherited a number of tremendous attorneys in the Office of Chief Counsel, and over the last nine years, I've started to be able to have the priv privilege of shaping the office going forward. And Amel is one of those attorneys I've brought in. And uh, she started off at the Central Valley Board, did a terrific job for them. Um, we try not to raid the Central, or Central Board or any of the other regional water board attorneys and move them up to the State Board where <coughs> we want them to do the best for the State Board members. But Amel is a case of us doing that. Um, we really faced a crisis a few years ago as we had a number of retirements. And uh, Imel came to the State Water Board about the same time that our stormwater legal guru, Betsy Jennings, was retiring. And Imel inherited a lot of the stormwater portfolio from Betsy. And this particular award is a sustained superior accomplishment award. That means it spans over 18 months. And really for Imel, I'm going to have it extend across the three years that she's been here at the State Water Board and the three enormous projects that she's had to address almost simultaneously. She had the municipal stormwater permit for the small municipalities, the phase two permit. Very important permit, regulates a lot of small but diverse municipalities throughout California. A lot of unique legal issues as we were evolving from the first generation of that permit to the second. There were a lot of commenters, lots of unique legal issues, how to deal with the receiving water limitations issue and how that would apply out for small municipalities. That one's still on ML's plate. We'll get that figured out eventually. Um, how to address total maximum daily loads um, that the regional boards have been adopting. That same type of work carried over to the Caltrans permit. And in the Caltrans permit, here we had the first permit that had to really incorporate and embrace a wide range of total maximum daily loads. Incredibly unique legal issues. No other state has really had to grapple with it the way that California has. And Amel was working right there with the Division of Water Quality staff, the board members, Caltrans, executive staff, to make sure that that was adequately assessed. She has another matter, which I actually, when I put this award in, thought would be done by the time the presentation came, and that will be later today. That's the Central Coast Ag Order uh, and the petitions challenging that are, that are before the State Water Board right now. Throughout this process, everyone who's worked with Amel has appreciated her legal acumen, her wisdom, her patience, and for those of us on the inside, her incredible, incredible attention to detail, 
but also her organization, something that I am often lacking because there's so much coming at me. And I think Phil and I have really challenged ML over the last couple of years. And if you, if you ever went into her office before the last 18 months, it was meticulous. But with these three items, it's slowly starting to bury her. So, uh, Emel, I thank you for the tremendous work you've done for us. Um, and I'm pleased to present you with the State Water Board's Sustained Superior Accomplishment. Thanks. Just, just very briefly, it is in my pleasure and honor to work with everyone here. Um, so, my pleasure. Thank you. They're connected. That's right. Thank you all. I love those. Hello. Well, there's still a lot of you here. How nice. Um, we're now moving on to the public forum, and the board will hear from anyone wishing to speak about any matter that's not pending before the board. Do we have any cards? No, no. Okay. Um, we have a pretty hefty agenda today, as you may have noticed. So there are a couple of things. Um, I will do, at some point, a mid-morning and a mid-afternoon break. They'll be short. Uh, and then we'll take a shorter than an hour lunch somewhere between noon and 1, depending upon the the, where we are in the uh, agenda. So um, for those of you who know we won't have a full hour from noon to one, we'll probably take a, a half hour or 40 minutes somewhere in there at a logical uh, break period. Um, we're now up to the minutes of September 10th. Um, I have a correction to the minutes. Um, we're at on my report where I talked about Board Member Diadamo and I going to the Salinas Valley, we actually didn't hear about water supply issues. We heard about farming and flood control issues. So if we can make that change, that would be great. Are there any other changes? I had one. Um, I wasn't here for it, but um, I understand that at the end of the um, meeting on the Central Coast um, order that the um, ex parte uh, provision was um, extended to uh, seven additional days. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's right. All right. Do I have a motion to accept the minutes as amended? <coughs> so moved. Great. Abstention? Or are you? No, I was there. You were for part of it. Okay, great. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. There we go. Minutes are approved. Uh, board member reports. Sorry, I almost said creature report. Creature? Well, you've got to know <laughs> octonauts. Board member report. Board me Sorry. <laughs> Grand chop. Um, any reports? Yep. Yep. So, a um, week and a half ago, I was at uh, Region 8, and um, after the meeting, took a really interesting tour of Riverside County's uh, low-impact development project. 
And uh, this is at Riverside County Flood Control and Water Conservation District's uh, headquarters. You're shaking your head, so I guess you've been there before, huh? Um, anyway, uh, it was fascinating. They've uh, redone a 15-acre site, and it is now used as a, uh, a testing facility, testing um, uh, uh, storm catcher benefits of cutting-edge, low-impact development um, uh, uh, techniques. And um, it'll be interesting to see the progress of this because they're, they've got all kinds of interesting things with um, raised planter boxes and... Um, 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 pervious concrete pavement in different um, applications and uh, testing the uh, capture uh, in terms of water quality. And the other thing that I thought I'd report is uh, coastal cleanup. Um, uh, I decided to do a little something different closer to home. Coastal cleanup, for those of you who don't know, also includes river cleanup. Yay. So where a lot of the trash uh, is generated. So um, I went to uh, Modesto at uh, Legion Park right off of the Tuolumne River and uh, did some cleanup with my son, and we canoed in the, in the river, and we were able to pull up all kinds of trash, including a big tire that he went in and took out of the river. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, I have um, three, well, actually four items. Uh, my coastal cleanup was uh, near my home as well, which is the Pacific Ocean, and um, uh, in Redondo Beach, and it was it too was very enjoyable. And I have never seen so many people out on the out, uh, so it was really quite wonderful. Uh, I attended the uh, regional board meeting in the Colorado River region, and they uh, adopted a. Um, administrative civil liability order for Browley, something that they had been working on for, for years. And so uh, the settlement was uh, for a million dollars in um, divided between the WDR account and the uh, cleanup and abatement account. And the city, new city manager for Browley, this is a low-income community, disadvantaged community, was there and um, uh, expressed her she was quite eloquent in her desire to move forward and they now have a, a facility that will not be uh, violating anything I don't they don't anticipate and we don't either so it was it was on the whole it was very sad but it was also very uplifting so it's part of our job but it's one reason we have these kinds of um, of enforcement actions to actually start to improve things uh, secondly, uh, the Region 7 is quite proud of being the second uh, regional board to um, adopt the uh, on-site wastewater treatment system implementation program. And, uh, and so I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that you knew that the work that we did on that is starting to move through the regions and Region 7 is on board. Uh, today in uh, Region 4, uh, Irma Munoz, who is on the Region 4 board, is doing a staff training on working with disadvantaged communities. And uh, based on uh, how that goes, my, ge my guess is that we will try to make sure that her efforts are, uh, are spread to other regions as well as the, the state board. So I just wanted to make sure people knew about that. Thank you. Well, my uh, coastal cleanup event was also a river cleanup event. And uh, where I go, and I have proof, uh, American River Parkway, where I go to ride my bike and walk. And so I, too, was very, very pleased by the turnout, huge turnout, lots of kids, family, um, groups were organized. And uh, I guess my only disappointment of the day was I spent hours and hours picking up cigarette butts. Oh, yeah. All cigarette butts. Yes, I mean, except for you know one small dump site that I you know hit upon, uh, the rest was cigarette butts. Amazing, amazing. Um, I also wanted to report on uh, two regional board items, uh, specifically the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, who had their meeting. Janine, you can do away with the photo now, please. <laughs> uh, at the last meeting, the regional water board, and, and uh, Stephen will remember this, um, annually, as part of Pollution Prevention Month, um, um, announced a winner of the Dr. Tang 
Chung Wu Pollution Prevention Award, which recognizes um, accomplishment in obviously pollution prevention. And this year's um, award was presented to the city of Palo Alto for their efforts on addressing constituents of emerging concern. Um, so, um, I, you know, another note of congratulations to the cities for their effort. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to just give a brief alert on, and then I'll report to back um, more in November, but it's on the line of learning from our regional water boards and, uh, and uh, adapting some of the good things that they do. I think a few months ago I reported that the uh, Central Valley Regional Water Board started including uh, reports, status reports on achieving their performance targets um, in the executive officer's report. And I see that, that we're starting to do that in uh, Mr. Howard's executive director's report, so that's good. And so, um, and something else which, you know, again, I will observe, report back, and see if we might, might uh, borrow from our regional board, this time the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, um, a small group of, of um, board members and staff not exceeding a quorum, Michael, has been working um, on a priority setting effort. And it was announced at the last board meeting that in November, the Regional Water Board will hold a public workshop on those priorities, their priority setting process, and obtain input before finalizing them. Now, that's something that we don't do. Um, but I, you know, again, would be very interested in seeing how that effort goes at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board. Report back to you and see if it's something that we can incorporate into our own processes. Great. Great, Great reports today. Um, I had coastal cleanup day. Um, my two daughters and I went to our local shoreline in Sausalito by the Bay Model. But it was very rainy, so we worked for about an hour and a half and then saw a lot of students from nearby, but there wasn't a huge turnout because I think about an inch and a half of rain dumped on it. The folks that were there who are the, uh, you know, the, the veteran coastal cleanup folks said it was the first time uh, there was ever rain at the coastal cleanup day in the 15 years. And it's the third weekend of September, so this year, the third weekend was the latest possible date, the 21st. Interesting. But, so, uh, but we sallied forth, and it was by the Bay Model, which is a wonderful place to visit if you ever have a chance. Two-acre model of the Bay and Delta. And so my kids and I went and checked that out because it's indoors. So. <laughs> and lots of cigarette butts. Yeah, lots of cigarette yeah, butts. Yeah, they were, they were not happy. The kids were not happy about those cigarette butts. So, Actually because they're hard to pick up. <laughs> I know, exactly. So, uh, a report from the North Coast Regional Board. Uh, last month, uh, there was a workshop on the Russian River, uh, which was well attended by uh, federal agencies, the Sonoma County Water Agency, um, and uh, our TMDL staff at the North Coast Regional Board provided um, some uh, updates on the TMDL project and there was uh, good in public input from different stakeholders. I highlight that because it's an, another one of our models in the state where we have a lot of different interests that are working together tirelessly to solve uh, difficult problems related to uh, water rights, fish habitat, a biological opinion that has to be managed. So I just wanted to highlight that effort of collaboration. Uh, also, another issue of statewide significance in the North Coast uh, is the issue of marijuana cultivation and water impacts, both in water quality and in um, quantity. And the North Coast region continues to be show leadership, in my opinion, in convening panels of multiple stakeholders in this uh, difficult challenge and important challenge. And uh, notably, the uh, Mendocino County Resource Conservation District folks um, provided a lot of input to that panel to give some local perspective on, on the tools that are available. And it's a challenge, but continues to be high on the radar uh, at North Coast Regional Board. Finally, uh, it's sort of transitioning to this month's work at North Coast. Uh, last month, there was an update on the implementation of the Phase Two Municipal Stormwater Permit that this board adopted in February. And you know the regional boards have to uh, help us implement that. And so there was an update on that, and that will continue into this month's agenda this week, and we'll get some more detail on, on the phase two implementation. And with that, 
uh, thank you for the opportunity to report. And great reports today, by the way, yeah, fellow I board agree. members. Those were terrific reports. Thank, thank you. I, I don't have one today. Just been a walk <laughs> all the time. Thanks. Um, now we move to uncontested items, and we have a couple of them on the schedule, but we also have another couple of them where we may not have speakers. On item 9, we have, if necessary, and on item 10, we have none. And so I'm looking to the audience to see if anybody or anybody on the dais objects to us moving item 9 and 10 also into the consent calendar. Any object objections? Going once, going twice. All right, so we will now uh, take item 3, 4, 9, and 10. Have a motion? So moved. I will second. Right. Favor? Aye. Aye. Great, okay, those now are taken care of. Moving on to item number five, uh, National Water Quality Initiative Projects. Johnny and the whole team. Sam. Hi. Good morning, uh, Chair Marcus and members of the board. Uh, my name is uh, Johnny Gonzalez, and I'm an engineer with the uh, Division of Water Quality. Well, my responsibilities deal with uh, coordinating the statewide irrigated lands regulatory program on uh, the biosolids uh, land application program. Um, this morning, we're going to talk about partnerships that we formed uh, between several agencies, uh, several stakeholders, uh, and what I call liaison groups, which are the RCDs and Farm Bureau uh, uh, folks in two areas, the Cayagas Creek and the uh, Salt River. Um, now, to set the stage, um, I wanted to just uh, mention that the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program has been developing for about 10 years, and it's charged with um, regulating um, agricultural discharges that uh, uh, may impair waters, and then to move towards um, uh, management practices that would uh, mitigate or at least uh, address the issue at hand. Um, next slide. Uh, to do that, um, the regional boards uh, work closely with their colleagues in both the non-point source uh, um, and TMDL units to adopt, uh, develop uh, waste discharge requirements and or conditional waivers of waste discharge requirements. And this map here uh, indicates the dark green, which are regions that have um, adopted um, uh, WDRs or waivers of uh, WDRs. The light greens are in the process of adopting them. I might say that this is a little outdated because um, uh, Stephen, uh, San Francisco uh, region um, is in the process of developing a vineyard waiver um, for Napa and Sonoma. And also uh, Tomales Bay is a TMDL, uh, which followed the same model that we'll be presenting this morning. Um, down in the bottom region uh, seven is in the process of moving from conditional prohibition which is why it's blue and now they're picking up uh, conditional waivers and they've adopted uh, uh, Coachella, I'm sorry, uh, Palo Verde um, Ward and they're working on additional ones. Um, and so uh, moving on with the next slide, uh, just a brief uh, outline of the different phases of the development of the irrigated lands program. Uh, the first five years typically is um, uh, just uh, herding the cats, so to speak, getting all of the uh, folks that are not used to being regulated to enroll, a lot of public education, outreach, um, some ambient monitoring, and then a very important part was the formulation of the uh, different stakeholder committees, which are technical committees, management plan committees, and public advisory type committees, just to kind of lay what's happening uh, and moving forward into the second phase, which is now doing things with the monitoring that you're receiving from the ambient side of things and really zeroing in on uh, areas that they can prioritize uh, with the information they received. Um, that phase calls for uh, key development by the growers and coalitions of management plans um, that include best management practices uh, and then performance monitoring. 
Um, the third phase, which are now just entering, been trying to work this thing in for the last three years, um, called a team concept uh, and uh, third party certification uh, groups acknowledging their expertise and trying to pull them into the program to, uh, to get their resources, uh, which they have plenty in terms of uh, knowledge of the, of the land, the agricultural practices, and also very important is they have a relationship with the growers. That's, that's a key piece to this. Uh, uh, this next phase. I couldn't get any traction uh, for the first uh, couple of years uh, outside of the discussions with the different agencies um, because there wasn't any funding and, and I couldn't get to the, the identification of projects, which is where the National Water Quality Initiative came in because that formalized the partnership between uh, the uh, NRCS and, and EPA and several of the liaison uh, groups, um, RCDs, all those that we're trying to get in the team concept now become a formal uh, partnership uh, in the water quality initiative that is funded. Um, so uh, I want to turn it over now so that we can open up that National Water Quality Initiative uh, and then uh, that will be with Alan Forkey. I'll let him introduce himself, followed by EPA, Valentina and uh, Sam that will uh, also indicate what their partnership is with uh, the National Water Quality Initiative. Region 4 was uh, going to be here as well. Uh, they have Cayugas Creek and an instrumental part of this initiative is to have the regional boards on board. That's a key piece because obviously they're the ones uh, with the boots on the ground. Um, and so um, Region 4 was very instrumental in getting Cayugas Creek, so I'll be presenting part of their uh, information uh, later on. So turn, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Alan. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Is this on? Uh, sorry, there we go. My name is Alan Forkey. I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Farm Bill Programs for the USDA, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which I'll refer to as the NRCS uh, from this point on. Uh, we're a voluntary conservation assistance agency that provides assistance to farmers and ranchers, agricultural operators on anything dealing with natural resource concerns on their, on their property. Next slide, please. Uh, our funding uh, comes from Title II of the Farm Bill, which we're waiting for a new Farm Bill now. We've been waiting for the last year plus. Uh, but the key uh, program that I want to center on uh, was funded in 1996. Uh, there's a list of all the different programs from financial assistance programs to stewardship programs to conservation easements to working landscape easements that we administer uh, in all 50 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, in 1996, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program was authorized by Congress, and it is still in effect. Next slide, please. EQIP, as I'll refer to it, uh, targets the broadest range of natural resource concerns that we provide assistance to, to private landowners. Uh, we do this through a public input pro process. There is also a provision in EQIP that uh, allows us uh, re to provide assistance to landowners in helping them to comply with environmental regulations. We've been doing that ever since the inception of the program back in the mid-90s. Uh, the public input process occurs at three levels. Uh, we have um, a national process in which the chief of the NRCS meets uh, on a regular basis, twice a year at least, with agricultural groups and environmental groups to de determine what those national priorities are. At the state level, uh, the state conservationist for NRCS works with uh, state technical advisory committees. Uh, we have over 100 members, uh, including nonprofit organizations, state and federal agencies, farm groups, individuals who participate in that. Uh, the state water board and EPA are also members. Um, at the local level, um, NRCS's delivery system includes uh, presence in every county. Uh, so we have 54 field offices in the state of California. They meet with local work groups. Those local work groups are subcommittees of the State Technical Advisory Committee, and they also provide information to NRCS on where to, where to target these priority funds. Next slide. So some of the things that we focus on, um, rangeland health, water conservation has been a huge issue in California, agricultural water quality, uh, soil erosion, uh, dairy water quality. We've had a groundwater quality program for dairies for the, since about 2005. Uh, soil health, uh, forestry issues, as well as air quality. 
Next slide. Uh, we have also established quite a few national and statewide local initiatives. Uh, recovery of sage grouse populations, working with ranchers on sage grouse habitat. Uh, we've put quite a few million dollars into helping landowners transition to organic agriculture. We are getting in on the ground floor of energy conservation. Uh, we have a salmon recovery initiative that we've launched this year. Our national air quality initiative was uh, um, funding specifically targeted to air quality. Uh, at the National Water Quality Initiative, when we've also provided this assistance directly to tribes. The National Water Quality Initiative was originally funded in 2012 as a national initiative. Uh, all NRCS offices in, in all 50 states were instructed to reserve a minimum of 5 percent of the general equip allocation uh, to target water quality concerns. For California, this represented a little over two and a half million dollars. We were also instructed to select at least one, but not more than three, Hydrologic Unit Code 12 watersheds, which are actually fairly small because of the problems we had in California trying to obligate two and a half million dollars to really small areas with just a few landowners. We actually got a waiver to allow five of these HUC 12 watersheds. Uh, and in California, our partnership, uh, the base of the partnership included um, collaboration with both EPA and the State Water Board. Next slide. Uh, the selection criteria was that these watersheds had to have a 303 delisted water body uh, from agricultural sources, nutrients, and sediments for the most part. Uh, we targeted these partnerships uh, to existing monitoring efforts that were being done by the state and EPA, including baseline data so that we could evaluate success. Uh, the goal of this program is to try and get 303 delisted water bodies delisted. NRCS plays a key role in this at the local level by making determinations of what the likelihood is of, of having landowners actually participate in the program. So that was a key part of it. Uh, in focusing on the, uh, the concerns, the guidelines set forth in the Irrigated Lands Regulatory Program was a key part of the criteria for this initiative. Next slide. So some of the practices that we were encouraging, NRCS has about 160 different conservation practices that we make available to landowners. Uh, the core practices uh, primarily looked at ways of vegetative and management practices, ways to prevent uh, surface runoff and erosion, irrigation-induced erosion, anything that would transport sediments with pesticides and nutrients attached to them into adjacent water bodies. These included things like cover crops, contour buffer strips, grass waterways, field borders, nutrient management, and a lot of irrigation water management. Next slide. These were also paired up with structural practices such as micro-irrigation systems, roof runoff structures for dairies, uh, stream crossings, access roads, watering facilities, and structures for water control. Next slide. Uh, we use the valuation criteria uh, when we select the, every landowner that applies for this program uh, has to be ranked and evaluated compared to the environmental benefits to be achieved. So we used certain factors like proximity to 303 delisted water bodies. Those landowners that were closest and most affecting a water body would receive higher points. We also looked at the percentage of that landowner's property that was within that watershed. Uh, a higher percentage of the landowner's property would give them higher points. We also looked uh, at the, the number of core practices, uh, which we think are probably going to have a much higher uh, probability of solving the problem. Uh, and we looked at a lot of soil and landscape features, uh, such as a soil hydrologic group. Uh, soils with a high, run, high infiltration rate are probably not going to contribute so much to surface water quality as it would groundwater problems. Uh, but uh, soils with hydrologic group D, uh, high runoff, would certainly have an impact on surface water quality. Next slide. So when we started this project in 2012, uh, we had five watersheds that we had been approved for. Uh, that include two of them in the Cayagas Creek watershed in Ventura County, which um, all three of us, EPA, State Water Board, and NRCS agreed was probably the highest priority in the state. Uh, we also went to the, uh, the Garcia River watershed. There were two HUC-12 watersheds that we, we funded up there uh, in the central or the north coast. 
uh, and then one that NRCS uh, had been paying particular attention to for the last several years, the Salt Creek watershed in Humboldt County near Ferndale, which is extremely impaired. Um, next. Uh, in 2013, the Garcia River watersheds, uh, we had roll enrolled almost 24,000 acres of land and that was being treated. There really wasn't a lot of landowner interest. So for 2013, we focused two additional watersheds into Cayegas uh, in Ventura County. And this is what we ended up funding this, this fiscal year. Uh, four projects, four Huck 12 watersheds in the Cayegas Creek watershed and uh, one in the Salt River, the second year of that same watershed approved in 2012. Next slide. So program delivery. Um, when NRCS funds these projects, we're dealing with Farm Bill dollars. These are federal authorizations. Uh, they are an annual appropriation. We have to obligate these funds within the federal fiscal year. So all funds received in any particular year needs to be obligated to a landowner contract in that year. Uh, applications are accepted on a continuous basis, but we set timelines during the year so that we can make funding decisions, knowing that we have to get those funds obligated, get the landowner cleared through all their eligibility requirements, uh, and begin the process of planning so that we can come up with a schedule for how and where, when they're going to apply these practices. All applicants, as I mentioned, are screened and ranked according to the program objectives and the level of environmental benefit that they are going to achieve. Those with the greatest environmental benefit will, will receive funding first. For the most part, this is a competitive process. Not everybody gets funding, but if we see the opportunity to fund additional projects, uh, we will, if we have the funding, we will target additional funds to those, to those areas. Uh, and once applicants are selected for funding, they begin the process through a schedule of operations to begin applying those practices. Uh, the contracts run for a period of about two to three years for the most part. So landowners that were approved even in 2012 will still be applying practices probably this year and possibly even next. Quick next question year. before you move on. Yes. With respect to um, the third bullet there, are you able to estimate or project or quantify the environmental benefits that are expected? Uh, in many cases, we can. We use um, technical models, uh, universal, uh, revised universal soil loss equations, uh, pesticide screening tools, uh, pasture productivity index. Uh, there's a number of uh, runoff and erosion models that we have access to. Oh, in addition, so. there's a number of landscape features that we can look at the probability. It's basically by doing a risk assessment to determine which, which landowners, which properties based on the soil type, slope, proximity to these 303 delisted streams are going to have the highest impact on those streams. We also look at the practices they select. So a landowner who's selecting um, vegetative buffer practices to protect streams and waterways uh, will likely receive higher points than somebody who's not selecting buffer practices. Yeah, and real quickly to clarify, uh, we're talking about competition within the selected HUC 12 areas, not yes, statewide. All, all of these landowners as part of their, this initiative all just compete with each other. Yes. Uh, uh, let me add one, one thing. Another uh, ranking tool that, uh, that needs to be considered is whether or not there's a regulatory driver uh, in the region, uh, like the Irrigated Lands Program that's setting out requirements uh, through the waiver, that this also is considered in the ranking process. And that's where the link is between these agencies. You can start to see it unfold and how the, the program matures. Now we can start pulling in these uh, additional resources. That, that's correct. So if they are subject to ILRI, I LRP or uh, TMDL enforcement requirements that also provides extra points for that landowner. It's probably, you know, that sounds like the program is still developing, but um, what potential do you have if there were unlimited resources uh, as far as landowner interest? I'd have to have unlimited resources to put in more Huck 12 watersheds for, for probably one thing, but I think there is a lot of application here. Um, it's interesting, one of the questions that I got from the Environmental Working Group when we first developed this initiative is why is NRCS only putting 5% of their equipped budget into water quality? And if you actually look at what we do with all of the different initiatives, probably 70% um, of all the funding that we do affects water quality in one way mm -hmm. or the other. All our water conservation efforts, our cropland efforts, even our rangeland health and forestry efforts um, focus in largely on water quality. But I think there's a, there's a huge 
potential. We're looking at the, uh, the New River and the Alamo River down in, um, in the Salton Sea. Uh, we've got a number of projects along the coast. We have our own, actually, Monterey Bay Conservation Program that we've been funding for the last three years, which targets water quality in Monterey Bay. Uh, so that goes all the way from San Luis Obispo County up to San Mateo County and, provide, and even parts of San Benito. So uh, we target the Central Coast there through separate funds, and there's been about a um, million and a half to two million a year in that program as well. That's, uh, that's actually, uh, the Bay Delta Initiative is uh, separate from that even, but that targets water conservation, water quality, and habitat issues uh, through the uh, Bay Delta Federal Action Plan. And are, are, do you have uh, loan programs somewhat like our revolving loan uh, we don't, programs not, that EPA? Not like uh, the Farm Service Agency does, and sometimes, uh, you know, if a landowner gets those loans for conservation purposes, they can, they can apply. What we have is uh, was written into the 2008 Farm Bill uh, that um, socially disadvantaged, limited resource farmers can get advanced payments on the costs of putting in the conservation practices before they actually install the practice. So uh, if they can get those loans, that helps them uh, apply the practices, comply with the program, and then we issue the payment to them afterwards. So I, I know that funding is limited um, on our end at the, at the state, but um, I'd like to see if we could uh, long term develop a program where there's synergy between uh, state and federal uh, incentive programs, similar to what we see on the air quality side with the Carl Moyer, Moyer program. So maybe we could have a follow-up discussion on that, if you could be thinking about ways that a program could be structured. Sure. Next slide, please. So if you look at the, the progress summary uh, from 2012, we're still obligating contracts for 2013 fiscal year, so we don't have actual numbers yet. Um, we put in a little over two and a half million dollars, 26 landowner contracts. Cayagas Creek is uh, pretty much intensively farmed agricultural land, so there's not quite as many acres. Uh, they also put in about a half a million dollars worth of contracts that year, so uh, there, it really um, needed time to develop. And I think that's what you'll see in 2013, is Cayagas will expand more and you'll see a lot more money being, being um, spent down there. The Garcia River enrolled 23,900 acres, Salt River 4,213 acres. Uh, the landscapes were a little bit different. As I mentioned, Cayagas is largely uh, annually tilled crops, intensively farmed. You get up into the Garcia River, you're looking at a lot of forestry issues, a lot of uh, forest road access and culverts and drainage and, uh, and um, outlets, outlet structures to prevent runoff from getting dire going directly into creeks and waterways. The Salt River, there's a, there's, um, a lot of forest land, uh, which is where most of the problems started back in the early part of this, this century, or the early part of the, the um, 20th century, was from forestry operations in the Wildcat Ridge area. It created a lot of sediments that basically filled up the Salt River Channel. So we have forest land, we have a lot of dairy issues up there, and we also have a lot of pasture. Some of the things we did in Cayagas included irrigation reservoirs, underground outlets, nutrient management, and irrigation water management. Whereas up in the Garcia and the Salt, we're looking at access roads, uh, some roof runoff structures for the dairies, stream crossing, and also structures for water control. Next slide. It's an example of some of the, some of the projects that we've done. Uh, on the left, heavy use protection areas and roof runoff structures to prevent areas of concentrated animal impact. 